if you're, if you're called out of bed at 2 o'clock in the morning and you've suddenly got to take a call or suddenly got to jump on a helicopter, the big risk is you have this thing called sleep inertia. Have you heard about that? And you're sort of a bit, a bit like a few of you have got now, it's kind of yawns going on. Oh, go on. Best way to do it, 20 star jumps gets you right out of sleep inertia and, and into your car. So thank you very much. You can all sit down. I won't make you do star jumps. Don't worry. So ladies and gents, I'm well aware I'm the, uh, the graveyard slot of this afternoon. Um, thank you for bearing with us. And I've got to talk to you about pre-hospital data. No challenge here. Slightly dry. And again, thank you to Philips for sharing um, their support. And what I'm going to do is just tell you about uh, some work we've been doing on the air ambulance in the UK and just some general suggestions about how we can really improve patient care using data. And about 80% of the patients I see are patients like this, really bad trauma, and about 20% are cardiac arrest. The patient trapped in this car is not going to survive unless we do meaningful pre-hospital care. And I'm going to tell you another real hard-hitting case, um, which we went to, is a little kid called Harry. And Harry was a nine-year-old kid playing football, and his football went out into the road, and he ran across the road uh, to, to chase after his football, this road, busy road, and he was hit at about 80, 90 kilometers an hour by a high-performance motorcycle. He's lying in this road. He'd broken virtually every bone in his body. He would injured virtually every organ in his body. It's the sickest child I've ever had to deal with in my life. And I thought he was going to die. Now, what we strive to do on the air ambulance, of course, is to bring the highest possible level, the highest uh, level of care to kids like Harry to try and save their life. So think about the most injured, most unwell patient you've seen. Harry's lying on the floor, he's unconscious, he's barely breathing, he's in a bad way. And, and we get to these patients actually pretty quick. In Harry's case, we were in the air coming back from another mission, and we were, I was by Harry's side in about seven minutes after he was hit. Now, of course, what the first thing you do is you attach a monitor and up-pop these observations. Now, you don't need to know the normal pediatric ranges, I would suggest, to say these are really abnormal. Harry is super sick, his heart is beating in overdrive, he's not got much blood pressure left, and he's not breathing very well. And what we do on the air ambulance, like you will do in many of your services, is to administer critical care, ICU-level care, to patients like Harry. So we're going to decide to put Harry into a coma. We're going to anesthetize him on the side of the road. Probably the highest, riskiest procedure you can do, because if you get it wrong, there's one outcome and Harry's going to die. And the fact he's a child makes it even more risky and integral when I'm not a pediatric anesthetist. And what I'm going to do is share with you how we use the Tempest monitor to really facilitate a lot of this work. So clearly, having a monitor absolutely in the center of what you're doing, literally in the center, so we have pre-drawn drugs, we have to monitor the patient on a second-by-second -second basis. One drop in Harry's saturation, one drop in his blood pressure, is going to cost millions of neurons in terms of outcome. Now, that's all fairly routine, but what we then do with our data is where it gets slightly more novel, is that we are using our Tempus as a kind of airborne data center. So when we get on the aircraft, what we do is we start transmitting packets of data to a cloud and into something called Hemsbase, which is our own bespoke uh, data capture PRF system. And what this allows us to do is every set of observations that we're getting off Harry goes into this, and you can see it line by line. We're marking every single intervention we do. Every single drug is time-stamped very accurately on the Tempus so that we're not guessing retrospectively when we gave rock or adrenaline or blood, whatever. It's all accurate. And the cloud can then translate this into a graphical description of what happened to Harry in the pre-hospital setting. And just by some very simple software, you can automate that into a patient report. Now, why is that really important? And why is it really important that I think you do that on the way to hospital? Not when you get there, you do it on the way to hospital. So that when you touch down on the helipad, you've completed all of that data already.
Okay, so we're expecting a nine-year-old in polytrauma. We'll get more details as they arrive. This was the moment Harry Leake arrived in the major trauma centre at Southampton General Hospital. The nine-year-old lying seriously injured after he'd been hit by a motorbike outside his home. He was knocked unconscious, injuries top to toe, he has a right closed head injury. He he'd been flown here by the air ambulance after being given groundbreaking emergency treatment at the roadside. So remember what I said earlier about these silos? This is a fraught environment. The team are battling just like we were to save Harry's life, but they've got a tiny amount of information to go on, you know, just a few lines of a telephone call saying, we're coming. And then they've got to suddenly absorb all this information, deal with what they're seeing in front of them, and continue that. And what we really don't want to do is have this pre-hospital hospital divide because it's just not good for patient care. We need to prepare that team with as much information as we can, and I'm going to show you how we do that. And then, of course, we're the only team for 12 million people. The last thing I want to do is then sit there on a computer or an iPad typing stuff away and missing the next kid that needs us because we're sitting on the computer. Our turnaround times, and we have a KPI of less than 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes to be ready and take the next job. We regularly achieve that with this system. Now, what about clinical governance? Well, if we're going to anesthetize children, we need to have good governance around that. And the astute amongst you should have noticed that there was a bit of a dip in the oxygen saturation trace, way down to about 70%. What did that mean? Did we mess up the intubation? Was I guddling around in his airway too long? I would suggest to you that if you're going to do an intervention that has potentially serious risk, you need to be able to justify that that intervention was warranted. Now, I'm not just talking about anesthetics. Let's just take a more basic intervention. Let's take uh, needle chest decompression. You're just going to get the paramedic to put a needle into the chest because you think they had a tension. I had a patient in the ED a few weeks ago with a CT scan that looked like this. This is a needle chest decompression. And the needle is about two millimeters from the patient's aorta. Now, was that needle chest decompression justified? Well, I would probably want to know that they were tachycardic, hypotensive, hypoxic, to say it was worth the risk of putting this needle two millimeters next to the aorta. Because if that had gone a little bit further, that would have been fatal. And it would have been very difficult to say, well, was it the right thing to do? What is it the wrong thing to do? You need to know the patient's pre-intervention physiology. What about cardiac arrest? This is a defibrillator download of a resuscitation attempt. So down the left, you've got minute one, minute two, minute three. Each red bar is one chest compression. We've heard loads about CPR. I can look at that, and you can look at that from the back of the room and say, this patient is dead. They will never survive this. Why? Because there's massive time off the chest, there's two or three minutes to tube and get a line in, and if you look at the rate, it's up to sort of 200, bzzz, Giracel bunny on ketamine or something doing compressions. Totally ineffective CPR, all right? Now, when we did some research in Scotland on this, I would suggest to you that one of the most meaningful interventions you can do is to start looking at defibrillated downloads. Start looking at the quality of the CPR that's being performed in your service. Just by doing that, we saw a significant improvement. Just the Hawthorne effect of looking at it and people know that we were analyzing it made a massive improvement in the quality of our CPR. Now, my wife at the time was going to divorce me because I was running around with my laptop and USB stick into every defib I could get to get this data because I thought this is amazing. It's having such a powerful effect. The only way you can do this on a systematic basis is to link up all your defibrillators on a cloud, on a Wi-Fi, and after every resuscitation attempt, you should be downloading that data. I would suggest, especially in geography like Australia, remotely so you can see the quality of the CPR. And when we started doing that, we saw this massive improvement. This is the survival rate from cardiac arrest in our region compared to all the others. Very, very powerful effect from looking at resuscitation quality. What about KPIs? Just little simple things. One of ours is we should be giving tranexamic acid to all code red bleeding patients. Well, with a click of a mouse, 
we can see that because we're marking it. We know the physiology. We can say, give me every patient with a systolic of less than 90. Did they get their TXA? Clearly, data powers your R&D. Without data, you can't do anything. Let's go back to Harry lying on the road. You look at those obs. Most of you would say, Harry's bleeding. You wouldn't be wrong to think that. But actually, is he? If I told you that he might not be, you'd be quite shocked. And actually, the data that we've gathered from all of our physiology uh, downloads off the Tempus has powered this research, which shows that actually in nearly half of the patients, so if we go forward one, 9% of the patients that you see in major trauma will have a heart rate, this is adults obviously, heart rate of more than 100 and a systolic of less than 100. And this is because they have an isolated traumatic brain injury. Isolated traumatic brain injury can give you a vasoactive injury, vasoactive head injury that dis disturbs your cardiovascular system so much that you can actually think someone's bleeding. It enables us to do a really landmark study. Years ago, we would have anesthetized Harry with Atomidate and Succimethonium. One of the problems with that, as you can see in the graph, is you get this massive spike in blood pressure when you do laryngoscopy because there's no analgesic there. Not very good for Harry's head, giving him this massive surge in intracranial pressure. And what we did was we changed our anesthetic regimen to include fentanyl, and you can see it's much smoother. And by having really good, really good physiology, we can analyze the perianesthetic period and, and, and make sure that we're improving with the um, novel things that we've been doing. So what are we embarking on right now? I want to suggest to you that live data streaming is the way to go. At the moment, you're probably all pretty familiar with the concept of a helicopter or an ambulance having some sort of connectivity, particularly for 12 lead ECGs. If you've got a patient that's having some chest pain, you do your ECG, it shows a STEMI, you beam it ahead to the cath lab, someone calls you back and says, yeah, it's a STEMI, bring them here, we'll be ready. We're, we're, we've heard a lot about that. What we're doing is taking that one step forward. A really exciting concept, part partnering with Philips and actually the European Space Agency to say, well, can we really explore live data streaming? So instead of just sending a snapshot ECG as one data dump to the hospital, we're going to send a live feed of exactly what you see on the Tempus into the receiving hospital. Now you can imagine if that receiving team that you saw in the video that was a bit higgledy-piggledy, go-go, receiving Harry, could have been watching the whole scenario unfold. As we were getting the information, they were getting the information. It would allow them to prepare, it would allow them to have that shared mental model and much better situational awareness. Other concepts you've heard like stroke or sepsis, or unfortunately in the UK we sometimes have a queue of 10 ambulances sitting outside our hospitals. And if you could look at your early warning scores, which the Tempest calculates for us, and say, hey, that patient at number seven is by far the sickest, we should probably bring them in first as opposed to them making, waiting them in the queue. But one of the things that I'm most excited about is remote support. So what we do at the moment is we have a consultant top cover for the helicopter. So just imagine, actually, Harry had been attended by a pretty junior registrar. They've never anesthetized a child before. As was the case with Harry, it was getting dark. We weren't sure if there was enough fuel. We weren't really sure which hospital to go to. There's a lot of complex decision making to be done. But when any of you guys ring for top cover support, you probably pick up the phone and you say, this is what I've got. You have to kind of describe the situation. You have to describe all the observations and list them. And someone at the end of the phone has to sort of make that mental model and maybe look at a map and give you some advice. Well, just imagine if that top cover person had access to all of this information in real time. So as you're seeing that physiology, they're seeing the physiology. They can help you make these decisions. They can actually offload a lot of that burden. So you can just say, look, I need to focus on one thing. Someone else is going to think about what drug doses to do or what hospital to go to or how we're going to get there and all that kind of stuff. 
So what we're going to be launching in just a few weeks is the ability to actually stream this data. So we'll be able to see things like the mechanism of injury. P picture paints a thousand words. If I said that was the car that hit Harry, you instantly know this kid's going to be in a bad way. It allows you to see that live physiology. You don't need to spend time on the phone saying the pulse is this, blood pressure is this. You can just see it, and you can see all of it in one go. And really importantly, it allows you to see trends. Because, of course, what you don't want is just one snapshot. I want to know, well, what was Harry's physiology for the last five, ten minutes? Where's he going? What's he going to be like after his anesthetic? And you can imagine how valuable that would be to the hospital team. It allows us to look at those interventions and actually just follow the case through that what the crew are doing in real time so you can support them and you can see how oh, the anesthetic's done now, this is how they've responded. And if they're going to be doing things like anesthetized children, or well, you can actually really support them through almost in real time, helping them through a difficult intubation, for example, if you can see exactly what they're seeing down the end of the video laryngoscope. And when you can put all this together, you can imagine the situational awareness that you're going to have as that experienced, removed from scene clinician helping out a lesser experienced colleague that doesn't do this quite as often or is in a remote and rural location. It's going to be really powerful. So I think top cover in the future for us is going to look like this, sitting at my desk, almost like being there with the crew. And we're going to be coupling with this our team have body cams, and we're going to have a live streaming from the body cam as well, so we can actually see the scene as it's unfolding. And I think the final bit then is that, that closing the loop. If I'm giving some information about, you know what, we need to take Harry to Southampton Hospital, as you saw, I don't want to interrupt the crew and call them back at a crucial moment and interrupt them and disturb their flow. I'm just going to type on my computer, send a message to the monitor, go to Southampton, they hit a button, acknowledge, I know they've got it. Really nice, elegant, closed-loop communication. And as we move forward, as I explained this morning, into doing more care in the air and secondary transfers, the ability to do this monitoring continuously from the air without interruption and able to support the crew en route in terms of transport and retrieval is going to be really, really important. And I think because of this data transfer, because of our ability to support, patients like Harry are actually making really quite miraculous recoveries, as you can see in the picture. So ladies and gents, just to wrap up, I would suggest to you that data drives improvement. You've heard a lot about registries. You've heard a lot about the need to capture good data, because without data, you don't know where you are, and you can't set targets for where you want to go. All resuscitation attempts should have a defib download from every defibrillator in your service so that you know the quality of the CPR that's going on out there is really good. You should be making a note of physiology before critical intervention. You should be able to justify a risky clinical procedure was indeed justified. And embed that data directly into your patient record form it's really helpful for hospital teams. It makes it really seamless. You don't have to type it in. It saves time and improves your turnaround times. And think about streaming it to the wider team. It's not just the patient that's here that's my patient. My patient's their patient's your patient, and we should be sharing that really widely. Power your R&D, make really good research, and make your teams better so that more patients can go on and survive like Harry. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. Have a great evening.